The center of Almaty is all cake-like flower beds. It is special cars behind the party school. It is special yards on Tolibayev Street. It is a place where you don't know what to do after 10 p.m. I remember once in the 90s, our big company of friends went to Isakul. All we had was one tape with the only song recorded on both sides. It was called The Center of Almaty. Imagine having the whole tape with one single song. What was it if not an indicator of its wild popularity? Biknur Kisikov, writer, author of numerous novels, stories and poems, member of Jury of Literature Contest, inspirer and organizer of Kitab Fest Festival, founder of Kazakhstan Encyclopedia Project, encyclopedia.kz. And who was the author of the song, which then became a number one hit of the so-called central Almaty youth? His name is Yerlan Stambiakov. When one reads his official biography, they inevitably think, what could he ever have in common with the art? A stock exchange broker, director of a shopping center, twice a member of a city council, Maslihat. Also, he once headed the regional chamber of entrepreneurs of Almaty and even chaired its board. But it gets even more interesting Indeed, Yerlan Stambiakov, in addition to all of this, managed to plant thousands of trees as part of the Alma Kala eco movement. And he even had a chance to organize the gastronomic festival Toy Kazan. How was it possible that one man has so many facets? And by what miracle among these high profile activities he managed to find some time for songs and poems? And there were so many of them in his life, so many. Indeed, Yerlan Stambekov's creative records are no less impressive. He published more than 113 of his poetic works on stihi.ru website and wrote many more. But let's get back to his song, The Center of Almaty. What is so interesting about it, or even phenomenal? After all, I remember the times when it was played in almost every single neighborhood, and it was considered a kind of anthem, or even a manifesto of the Almaty youth. I think that the phenomenon of this song is both in its simplicity and in its melodious lyrics, and most importantly, in its uniqueness. After all, before Stambiakov, no one composed on this topic, and the Almaty city center has always been an original space and the place of sublimation of many creative energies. It is important to mention that Stambiakov wrote more than one song, and some of his works were included in the album, which he, of course, called the center of Almaty. It is interesting that his second song, Daughter, was composed specifically for the wedding of the daughter of his close friend, Nurlan Abdulin, a famous pop singer and honored worker of Kazakhstan. In 2020, Yerlan Stambiakov decided to spur public's interest in his somewhat forgotten song hit. And on his social network page, he announced the competition. He invited his followers to remake the lyrics of the center of Almaty song in accordance with modern realities. Dozens of his friends, colleagues and fans responded to his call. Contestants wrote about the Sirgix video surveillance system, and the construction of the BRT in Almaty, mentioned bike lanes and walking paths, complained about paid parking. In short, nothing limited their own imagination. The results of the competition were announced at Stambiakov's house concert, in the creative space of Ala Space. The finalists of the competition took the stage and, along with the host of the evening, performed an updated version of the old hit. By the way, this was not a one-time party. Irlan Stambekov decided to revive the tradition of house concerts and poetry evenings in Almaty. 
In this endeavor, he was supported by many famous musicians, poets, and writers of the city, including our program host, Fiknur Kisikov. The center of Almaty is not essentially a song, but verses read to the accompaniment of guitar. Since ancient times, urban poetry has been part of both literature and music. Thousands of years ago, the verses of Homer and Sappho were intended to be performed to the accompaniment of musical instruments. And in the history of our steppe, songs were composed to the words of Abai Kunanbai Uli. Shumush Bai Sariyev and others. Therefore, it was peculiar to witness that the Nobel Prize in Literature 2016 was awarded to Bob Dylan. Critics were not satisfied with the following complex sentence for having created new poetic expressions within the great American song tradition. And here it is appropriate to remember another poet, the talented Hakim Bulibekov, whose poems are saturated with a great love to the city. No, I won't leave Almaty. Let it be named this way. I was so often happy in this city. I was on close terms with it, and I can't live without its streets and gardens. Although they are being shrunk like a piece of shagreen, as well as its parks, squares, and cascades of new houses, but above all, kindness lives here. It can be seen in people's smiling faces. Oh, my city, it seems, all the heaven's goods condescended upon you. Hakim Bulibekov is a Kazakh poet, screenwriter, and director. He's the author of five collections of poems. Bulibekov graduated from the Kirov Kazakh State University and finished graduate school of the Physical Institute of the USSR Academy of Sciences in Moscow. He was a student of the famous physicist, the founder of quantum electronics, Nobel Prize winner, academician Nikolai Basov. In general, I notice that very often Kazakh poets work in fields that are distant from literature. Olja Sulimianov, for example, studied geology, Stambekov construction, and Hakim was a physicist. He participated in the polar expedition as an engineer of stratospheric sounding of cosmic rays and even managed to write a diary, which later he made into the book called Kipchak in Antarctica. We'll come back to this later. And yet, unexpectedly, Hakim gave up science and took a U-turn in his life. He has entered the higher courses for screenwriters, directors at the Goskino USSR and he successfully mastered both of these professions. For me, Hakim is truly a folk poet, but his admiration towards his people is not something he manifests with loud titles. His status as a folk poet means that he is truly accessible to his readers. And like any other true folk poet, he recites poetry everywhere. He can walk around the city at night and read poems to any strangers he comes across. He can read it in restaurants and cafes, in buses or trains. If only there were more people like Hakim, we would have had the poetry literally on every corner. Thieves set the price for my verses, a half tenge, and that's all. And I blew up. That's a robbery. It is not enough money for a line. After all, my verses are not corrupt. The public will read them. And I ask, what about conscience? It is low to underestimate the art. After all, a stanza is a whole story. But it needs to be made up. However, Hakim is not just a poet, he is also a prose writer. And his book, Kipchak in Antarctica, is one of the most severe prose about life in Antarctica. In general, this book is Bulibekov's memoirs 
about the time he spent on a scientific expedition to Antarctica and the events that preceded it. The book consists of four parts and a supplement with verses written by Bulibyakov. In the first part, entitled Bifurcation Point, we get acquainted with the author, a student of the physics faculty of the Kazakh State University. Once the dean invited students to take part in an expedition to Antarctica, the choice fell on Hakim as others refused. It wasn't as easy to travel somewhere at that time, so Bulibekov had to take an exam on the fundamentals of Marxism-Leninism and also to go through a bunch of other bureaucratic procedures. I had to submit nine references, nine applications and nine personal sheets with cover letters to the university department. Three references were signed by the university, four, rector, secretary of the party committee, chairman of the labor union committee, and the secretary of the university's Komsomol committee. It was the first time they met me in person, the moment they were signing my papers. In the papers, it was said that I was a cool guy, respected by my workmates, loyal to the ideals of communism, etc., etc. The remaining chapters of the first part are dedicated to packing and preparations, as they illustrate Soviet reality very clearly. It will be interesting for those who want to find out more about the era. In the second part, entitled The Road, Bulibekov describes his road to the destination. They traveled to Antarctica on a tourist ocean liner and stopped at foreign ports every now and then. These stops were, of course, a source of whole new experiences for the Soviet man. From this section, diary entries begin. In general, they are very trivial. In them, the author describes things he saw and things he did. He wrote about how overwhelmed he was with the abundance of ads, shops, eateries, and the lack of queues in the countries of decaying capitalism. How offended he was because of the fact that none of the locals knew anything about either Kazakhstan or Baikonur. How he exchanged his contraband gold coin for a pair of jeans and sported them around the capital of Uruguay. In the third part, the author described the harsh everyday life at the Mirny station founded in 1956 in Antarctica. Scientists, among whom was Bulibekov himself, were starting various kinds of machines, taking their readings and sending them to the mainland. Hakim's research was related to cosmophysics. In the Union, this science was in its infancy, and people didn't rely on it too much. And then follows the description of the everyday life of polar explorers, with its blizzards and storms, homesickness, squabbles and quarrels. But Hakim, despite the countless enumeration of everyday nuances, managed to introduce a certain flavor of romance into his narrative. For example, he described an even snow-white expanse and breathtakingly blue sky. The blue twilight, blue snow, sky and air, everything was blue. Everything was exactly how he imagined in his childhood. Everything he ever wanted to see, things he only saw on the cover of a cheap children's book, painted in quite a sloppy manner. But he got a chance to see everything with his own eyes, the reality created with the brush of the great master, the nature. It was both beautiful and sad. In the fourth part of the book, when the author leaves Antarctica, he met his future wife, whose name was Lubov, love. And it was antarctically beautiful. After all, love is the driving force of any poet, loved for loved ones, love for the family, and finally, love for the city.